Well, beloved in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In uh, last week's lesson, we heard that Jesus had taken his disciples and traveled to Gentile territory north of Galilee into the region of Tyre and Sidon so that he could be alone with the disciples and they could get some much needed rest. But we also learned that things didn't quite work out as planned as far as the rest was concerned. However, we were presented with a beautiful story of a wonderful, persistent, saving faith of a Canaanite woman who came seeking after Jesus. Today, God's Word takes us to another of the great teachings of faith found within Holy Scripture. It's a section of God's Word that confronts each and every one of us with one of the most important questions that Jesus ever asked. And your answer to that question will determine the very destiny of your soul. Today's reading is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, verse 13 to verse 19, where I would ask if you're able to rise out of respect for the glorious truth of God. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in its truth. Your word is truth. Thank you. Please be seated. In this morning's text, we find ourselves still within Gentile territory in the northernmost area in Palestine known as Caesarea Philippi. It is here Jesus had gathered his disciples together and asked them a question that would be asked many, many times over and over again. He asked his disciples, who am I? This question is the question of the ages. And it is the same question that you and I must also be asked. In fact, every generation must be asked this question because this question takes us to one of the greatest crossroads of faith in the Bible. You see, with this question, the road of faith divides off into two different directions, either to the right or to the left. And the very foundation of our faith depends upon the choice that we make regarding this all-important question from Jesus. Who do you say that I am? Jesus had now been teaching his disciples for almost three years. We are quickly advancing to the critical point of the Galilean ministry. In other words, Jesus was now ready to come to the end of his ministry here on earth, and therefore the cross was looming larger and larger before him. Because of that great fact, the ministry of Jesus was laid on the line. Was, was this ministry to be carried out by his followers through more generations coming? Or was it now just to be laid aside as simply another fad or trend of, of history? The answer comes in response to the question, who am I? Now, of course, Jesus longed to hear the right answer. And in these recorded words of Peter, he got the answer he was looking for. Let's read the text again. Matthew 16, 16 reads, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Now, when Peter confidently confessed these words to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, it is obvious he was experiencing the light of his Savior's glory shining deep within his soul. And what Peter says here is so significant. You see, Peter, when he said, you are the Christ, he is acknowledging that he recognized the office, the role that God the Father assigned, anointed Jesus with. Peter recognized this Jesus, God's anointed Son incarnate, as the one who came to fulfill all things promised by God from the beginning. He recognized Jesus as the Christ, the one who came to accomplish all the salvific work for the human race on behalf of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So for Peter to acknowledge to Jesus, you're the guy. <laughs> you're the guy. You are the lamb, the final sacrifice, the one who we've been waiting for all this time. For Peter to recognize and acknowledge that wonderful fact before Jesus, that, my friends, is a huge deal. And this confession, this answer Peter gave to the question Jesus asked is the question that needs an answer. This question shows to us exactly why we are at the crossroads of faith in this text. Because unless you and I can make the same confession about Jesus Christ, we are on a different path. You see, we split away from God on our walk through life unless we all can make the same confession about His Son, Jesus Christ. And that is what makes the Christian different from any other person. We believe the Bible's rock-solid truth about who Jesus is, and we accept Jesus for what he was and what he still is, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we stake this very life, the life we are living, and we stake the right to live again in the claims of our Lord. Because he is to us the rock of ages the very foundation upon which we build our Christian faith. In this text, Jesus here is talking about the church. He is talking about the establishment of that which is to come for generations upon generations. Unfortunately, Many people disagree about these beliefs concerning Jesus Christ. In fact, the record of church history overflows with the sad commentary that people, nations, and churches have split apart and gone their separate ways when confronted with the question, who is Jesus? But this is a most valid question. It is the age-old question of what is life and who controls my life. And Jesus asked that question because he was now ready to go to the cross. And every question that he asked at this time would of course be pertinent to everything later on. And at this moment, he was teaching these men, those who would be the first true believers of Jesus, those who were to go out and make disciples of all nations, Jesus was teaching them about the establishment of the true church on earth, the church of Jesus Christ. This text that is before us this morning is the first recorded time Jesus uses the word church. And it ought to thrill us, folks, as Christians, when we hear Jesus say, I am going to make the church the rock of ages because it is going to be built upon me. And unfortunately, regrettably, these clear words from Christ have caused much division in Christendom regarding who is the rock of ages. But we stand firm, I hope we do, in our Christian conviction that the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. However, in relation to this great reality, 
people are going to disagree violently about Jesus. Why is that? Well, because people, in their opinions, think of Jesus differently than who he is. They think of Jesus as a good man, a teacher, a community organizer, a life coach, and many other things. But many of them fail to see Jesus as the Savior of sinners and Lord of his church. Many fail to see the church as you and me, sinful people, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And while the church is also the place where people gather to be taught and fed in word and sacrament, the true meaning of church is people. It is people redeemed by the blood of Christ. It is people who have answered the question like Peter, yes, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I believe that you have died for me and that you are uniquely God's Son. That, loved ones, is the confession you and I ought to make. That is the confession of the ages. The only question is, are you willing to truthfully make that confession? Today's lesson is all about the true identity of Jesus. That is why Jesus opened up the topic by asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? Let's listen again to the answer they gave to the master. Matthew 16, verse 13 and 14 reads, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now I find it rather interesting that the answer the disciples gave to Jesus were those of dead prophets. And it is true that people thought Jesus was one of these dead prophets come back to life. But I suppose they could have also answered Jesus a little more frankly. They could have said, some people think you're a wino. <laughs> some think you're a glutton. Some think you are nothing more than a sinner because you hang out with sinners. And Lord, some even say you are Beelzebul the devil himself. Yes, many things could have been said when Jesus asked them the question. But they were being polite to the Savior. They gave the best they could say that others had said about him. That's very similar to the way it is today, isn't it? There are many people now who say Jesus was a great man. He, he was a good person. Yet there are countless others who say that Jesus is nothing but some extremist teacher of old. Others confess, I don't believe any of that stuff about Jesus. That's in the Bible. And that Bible is nothing more than an old dead book. Who really believes that stuff now? Still others... Well, they know Jesus only through cussing and swearing. Think for a moment how many times people, even Christians, utter or text the words OMG or use the term, oh Lord, or oh Lordy. You would think they know God pretty well the way they continuously use his name. <laughs> but they don't. They just spew out these blasphemous words, perhaps mindlessly without realizing they're dragging God's name through the mud by doing so. Because to them, I guess, Jesus doesn't mean too much. So why do you think those who choose not to believe in Jesus choose instead to criticize or make fun of him? Well, the answer is rather simple. You see, Christianity stands or falls with the deity of Christ. If Jesus is not God, he cannot be the Savior. If Jesus is simply a man, even a good one, I can just take him or I can leave him. It's my choice. 
Ah. But if Jesus is God, that means he's making a claim on you. If Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you ignore him, you do so at your own peril. Because there are consequences. Yes, there are many differing opinions about Christ, even among Christians. But the stark reality is people who guess about Jesus' identity will always get it wrong. And when you get the identity of Jesus wrong, you get salvation wrong. And while one can certainly talk like a Christian and fool a lot of people into thinking they are a Christian, in the end, they will enter into eternal punishment with all the unsaved who never knew the Lord Jesus. That is why it is so essential, friends, to get the identity of Jesus right in order to get salvation right. Which means there is only one correct answer of who Jesus is. It is found in the confession of Peter. Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So do you believe that? I hope you can all answer yes. Because, loved ones, your eternity hinges on the answer you give to that question. You see, Christ is not asking you and me to, whether we think he was a wonderful person, a good man, a marvelous teacher. Those things are secondary in importance. The question of questions is whether we actually do believe that Jesus is God in human flesh and that he came as our substitutionary sacrifice to die the death that we deserve. Is Jesus the living Christ who has saved a wretch like me? That's the question you want to take home with you today. And if you don't remember anything else in this sermon, remember that question. Because that's the question that, that the text is bringing forward today, and that's the question of the ages. So remember that question. If you remember anything else, remember that question. This question that Jesus asked will forever represent the biggest question with which you and I as Christians are ever confronted. Because if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, it means that you will see the purpose for the whole Bible being written. Not only that it is a book to be followed in order to live a God-pleasing life, but that it is the very revealed, inerrant Word of God that shows me the only Savior to save me from my sin and my unrighteousness. Listen to what St. John, under the strict guidance of the Holy Spirit, wrote about the holy words of Scripture. John 20, verse 31 reads, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Loved ones, these words teach us that faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, is the faith that receives eternal life. And when Peter confessed to Jesus that he was the Christ, this is the only answer that Jesus wants to hear. And I'm convinced that when the Savior heard the joyous confession that radiated from his faithful and sometimes not so faithful Peter, he was so very pleased. How do we know? We know because in response to Peter's confession, Jesus responded to him with these very soul-satisfying words. Matthew 16, verse 17 through 18 reads, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, me, Christ, the rock, the rock of ages, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What Jesus said here to Peter is so important for us to see. You see, Jesus is saying that we cannot by our own reason or strength believe in him as our Lord or come to him. In other words, we on our own cannot accept Christ or make a decision for Christ or do anything on our own to be saved. Confused? Friends, who is responsible for our faith? Jesus tells us here it is God. And what Christ is saying is that like Peter, you cannot make this confession in your own flesh and blood. It is not something you will develop through your own reason, your own logic, or your own emotion. It is something that must come from outside of you because it is a gift from God. That is why the Father sends the Holy Spirit to work faith in us. That is also why God gave us the church on earth where the Holy Spirit does that work through the preaching and teaching of his word. But Jesus also said to his church, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus reaffirmed this when he said, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. In other words, as amazing as it may seem, church is a big deal. And Jesus tells us he has entrusted the keys of the kingdom of heaven to his church. What does a key do? It locks or it unlocks. Which means Jesus has delegated his authority to those who are called by the Holy Spirit to govern his church on earth and under Christ's ultimate authority through the application of his word, pastors have the authority to admit entrance into the kingdom of God through the preaching of the gospel to all who will receive it as well as the authority to exercise discipline concerning right and wrong conduct. Now regarding that last point, Jesus has made it very clear in the Bible that Christians have enough logs in our own eyes, so we're not to go around snooping to discover specks in someone else's. That being said, some sins must compel us to confront the sinner. And just as compassion compels a doctor to care for an injured person, so believers must deal in compassion with those in their fellowship who live in sin, apparently unaware of its consequences. That is why we work patiently and with love to win these fallen people away who have left the fold of Christ, we win them back into the fold. We win them back into the church through love and patience and telling the truth. Yet sometimes people will refuse to acknowledge their sin and continue to reject God's word. The answer to that, of course, is we must tell the truth. And the truth is, since they reject Christ and the salvation he alone has won for them, the gate of heaven will be locked to them. And if they die in their unbelief, they will be lost forever. That is why, friends, it is so important for the church to get this message out to the world so that individuals can repent and return to the open heart and outstretched arms of Jesus and then be assured that their sins have been forgiven. That is what the church has been given the authority to do. 
We have received the authority of our Lord himself to distribute the gift of divine pardon to everyone who is sorry for their sins. And that is why I'm so disappointed as a pastor and a Christian when so many people think it's no big deal to stay away from coming to church to hear the word and share in the Lord's table. Or they instead try to satisfy God with their perceived goodness, good deeds, clean living, etc. But my words of caution as a man speaking for God at this very moment, don't try to satisfy God with these things because you owe these things to God in the first place. Rather, satisfy him with a bold and confessing faith. Learn from Scripture that God is pleased when you get on your knees and say, Jesus, I thank you for saving me a sinner. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. That is what satisfies a holy God. That alone is what satisfies a holy God. When Peter acknowledged to Jesus that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, it was upon this confession that Jesus promised to build his church. This confession of who Jesus is is still the predominant theme of every congregation. And it is so sad that one specific institution can so poorly misinterpret, misrepresent these words. To, to feel that somehow Peter is the rock upon which the church is built. I'm truly saddened for people who have minimized this text and fought over the Greek when it becomes apparent in the whole scripture that Jesus alone is the living rock. Paul makes this very clear for us in these following passages. 1 Corinthians 10.4 reads, And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ, not Peter. And Ephesians 2.20 reads, Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, not Peter. And 1 Corinthians 3.11 reads, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, not Peter. And within the Psalms we hear clearly who the rock of ages is. Psalms 18 verse 2 reads, The Lord, not Peter, is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And Psalm 18, verse 31, For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Again, not Peter. This is God's Word. The words are clear. All one has to do is read them. One church has perverted God's Word. We know that church. Therefore, the Lutheran Church and all of Protestantism stands in open and uncompromising disagreement with that institution all institutions, no matter how large, that would change the meaning of these words. Friends, no man is the head of the church of Christ. Yes, God uses those he chooses to use and works through them, but no man is the head of the church. That title belongs to Jesus, the rock of ages. He is the foundation stone upon which the church is built, and the true Christian church is based solely upon the Lord Jesus himself. So rejoice in that fact. Rejoice that the Lord is Lord of his church and that Christ alone is the rock of ages, the foundation stone upon which we build and preserve our Christian faith. And friends, because... 
Christ is the head of the church. We can have confidence that the church of Jesus Christ will never be destroyed or overcome. Because our Lord said, even the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. So as long as the church remains a confessional church and acknowledges Christ as the rock upon which it is built, as long as the church acknowledges Jesus as the Son of the living God, as long as the church acknowledges Christ as the Son who came to save sinners from their sin, as long as the church stands courageously under the truth and entirety of the Scriptures, there is nothing that will ever destroy this church. The only question is, are you in Christ's church? And I'm not asking you were a member of this church or any church. I'm asking you, do you know the Lord Jesus personally as your rock of ages? That is the question. Friends, we who have faith in the Lord Jesus as the Christ, we have a relationship with God that will never end. And Jesus has promised to everyone who belongs to him that he will never leave you or forsake you. And he will be by your side to comfort you and guide you every day you walk upon this earth. And when the Lord calls you from this world, he will take you unto himself to live with him forever. Loved ones, because this promise comes from Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we can know it is true. So believe it. May God bless you today. May he bless you in the saving faith he has revealed to you so that you may go forward every day serving Christ, properly and faithfully witnessing to others and proclaiming the truth that everlasting salvation and complete forgiveness of sins is through faith alone, in God's grace alone, which is ours because of Jesus, the Christ's all-redeeming death and resurrection alone. Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your words today. Allow the Holy Spirit now to open our hearts and minds to receive those words. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be our rock of ages, our foundation upon which the church is built, the foundation upon which our lives are to be lived, the foundation stone that leads into the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for sending your only son to die for me. I thank him so much for that gift that you gave. In his name, I praise him and thank him. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.